Perhaps we'll just begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we uh, take a look into thy word, we thank thee for the Holy Spirit who wants to guide us into truth. And we're thankful for inquisitive minds, for questions about thy word, and we're thankful for answers that we can find there. And so we pray that uh, we might not be interested in human opinion, but in hearing the very word of God. We thank thee for thinking about us and for thinking of everything and providing for us this word of God by which we may be thoroughly furnished to every good work. Help us now, we pray, in the Savior's name. The first uh, question, which I find an interesting one, why would God want us to carry out his work when we would fail him so often? And I thought of the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised has God chosen, yes, and things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Sometimes as I'm preaching, people will come to me afterwards and they'll say, well, you know, I just, I couldn't do that. And they begin to explain, they give me the reasons why they feel disqualified for serving the Lord in a particular way. And after they've gone on for a while, I interrupt them and say, you know, you really are giving the job description. This is exactly the kind of person God wants to use. The very things that we think disqualify us from God using us are the very things that God uses. And so the Apostle Paul comes to the end of 2 Corinthians, and he says to them, you forced me to boast. Why, all the other preachers that come to town, they boast, and you think they're great, you see? And the danger is that because I don't boast, you don't take my message seriously. I don't care about you thinking highly of me. I don't think highly of me myself. But I do care very much that you listen to the message I have. And so you force me to boast. And so he goes through this long list and then comes to the end and says, I fooled you, didn't I? I'm not boasting in my strengths. I'm boasting in my weakness. I've been kicked around and beaten and floating out in the sea and in perils of my countrymen and and all the rest, he said, I'm not boasting in my greatness, I'm boasting in my weakness. I have learned a great principle, that God doesn't use us where we're strong, because then we'd take the glory. He uses us where we're weak. And so that's why God uses people like us, not because he doesn't have anything else to do. He could do it all himself. He did make the universe by himself, you know. But he started with nothing to make the universe. And so he gets all the glory for the universe. No one else can do that. And when he made the church, he started with nothing too, didn't he? The things that are nothing to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so if you feel weak and failing and without strength and not very eloquent, why, well, you're just the person for the job. That's exactly what God has said. I glory in my infirmity, said Paul, because that's where the power of Christ rests upon me. Where we think we're strong, well, that's where we're weak. Where we know we're weak, that's where we depend on the Lord. And that's where we discover how strong he is. So the reason God uses failing people is that he's found a way to get more glory for his son by using people like us. And the question obviously must be asked, if we fail, does that mean that God fails? Well, of course not. The, the scripture says, let no man take thy crown. What does that mean? That means that every crown will be handed out. There won't be any crowns left on the shelf. Someone else may get to do it. God very often bypasses some very eloquent, very gifted people because they happen to be too busy or they're distracted or they're dirty cups. I stay in some homes and they have a group of people over the evening before and uh, she brings out all the nice china. 
And when I get up the next morning, it was kind of late last night, all the china sitting in the sink, and I don't use any of it. I bypass it, and I take a plastic cup out of the kitchen to take my orange juice. And you know, many a time, there are people who have all sorts of ability, far more than, than we do, but they're dirty, or they're, they're busy, occupied with their own things. They're not empty. They're not available. That's what makes a good vessel, you know, if it's clean and empty and available. A vessel is just nothing surrounded by something to hold whatever you put into the vessel in, right? That's, if, if a vessel's full, you can't use it. It's already occupied. And so that's the picture that's given. A fountain, a fountain is just nothing, but it's nothing strategically located <laughs> so that the resources, the hidden resources, can come out to where people can use them. And so that's what God does. God takes up people like that and when you look at all the great men of history, they've all had their nothing experience. Whether it's Jeremiah or Isaiah or David or Moses, you name them. They all had that experience where they came to say, Lord, why ever would you use me? And God says, well, that's what qualifies you. That consciousness that there's no reason he could use, should use me except for his grace and for his big plan to make sure that his son gets all the glory. And so he uses people who are nothing, so to speak, to bring to nothing the things that are, that the Lord Jesus might get all the glory. According as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. Well, that doesn't mean that we um, promote failure or that we encourage sloppiness or carelessness in the service of God. It just means this, that... In the end, whatever failures I might have, God actually can take those failures and turn them to his good. And that's the marvelous thing, isn't it? When we get home to heaven, we'll discover that many of the things that we thought were broken and useless were the very things that he built into the magnificent structure he calls the church. Now here's a question. Can the Old Testament saints be viewed retrospectively as belonging to the church. Well, you know, there's this verse in Acts chapter 7. In the King James, it reads this way, verse uh, 38. This is he, that's Moses, this is he that was, oh, pardon me, Moses the prophet spoke of the Lord. And then he says in verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give to us. Are they part of the church? Well, this word church is used here. It's the word for congregation or assembly. And, of course, the Old Testament group of people that left Egypt and traveled through the wilderness, they're called here the church or the assembly, the gathering, the congregation. And so, too, the New Testament. We have the same term used. However, there is one obvious difference. Uh, if we go over to Ephesians chapter 2, we see that the church, this new thing that he is doing, Jew and Gentile being brought together into one, is built on a foundation. In other words, the foundation is the first thing laid. There's nothing underneath the foundation. There's nothing that comes before the foundation. And the foundation is the apostles and the prophets. So the foundation was laid, obviously, considerably after these Old Testament saints lived. I think, on the other hand, I, I recognize that these Old Testament saints, Abraham, he was saved the way we're saved. In fact, he's used as the model, as the prototype, isn't he? He's precedent case. And Paul argues the case that we can be saved apart from law, by grace alone, because Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. So in that case, it's quite clear that Abraham was saved by faith. He's a child of God. And Hebrews chapter 11 goes so far as to say that they did without so we could get in on the blessing, that they without us should not be made perfect. Abraham is the father of the faithful, of all who believe. And when God took him for a walk and showed him the sand and then showed him the stars, he said, these are your spiritual children. 
I am not one of those who believes that in a day to come, the church, that is those who are saved after the foundation was laid at Pentecost, that they will somehow be in a more intimate relationship than these Old Testament saints. I don't believe it. I can't believe that we'll be singing the song of Moses and the Lamb in heaven and Moses won't be there. Or that we, the, father, the, the, the children of Abraham, will be there, but Abraham will miss out. They did without so we could get in on it. So now we're in and they're out. Is that how it works? Of course not. When we see the New Jerusalem, we discover that the foundation stones are the apostles and prophets. Well, that sounds familiar. That's what we have in Ephesians 2. But then we see the names of the patriarchs on the gates. And so God's objective is not only to bring Jew and Gentile together in Christ, his grand objective is to bring all things together in Christ. Everyone linked to Christ. Every blessing will flow through him. So these Old Testament saints, now sometimes people will quote John the Baptist. John the Baptist said he was the friend of the bridegroom. And so they say, well, the church is the bride and all the Old Testament saints are the friends of the bridegroom and they'll show up and sit in the seats while we're up getting married, you see, that sort of a thing. Well, I personally think that John the Baptist was saying that he was going to be the best man at the wedding. He's the near kinsman of Jesus. He's the one who introduced the bride to the bridegroom. And so I think that's what he was referring to. And of course, the apostles, who probably will be in an intimate role as well, they also are called the friends of the bridegroom. That's not referring to the crowd. That's referring to the most intimate members of his wedding party. There will be a nation born in a day. Not so much um, the way that these Old Testament saints were saved by faith, but they will see the Lord Jesus in resurrected glory. They'll see the crucified Jesus resurrected and glorified. They'll bow at his feet and they will respond in faith to him, but only because they see him whom they pierced. That nation that is born in a day, I believe, will receive the earthly inheritance which was promised to the seed of Abraham, the seed of David. But I believe that those Old Testament saints will be with us in glory. You know, it says concerning Abraham, God took him, climbed up on the Frank Mountain just south of Hebron on a clear day in the springtime. You can see all the way to the snows of Mount Hermon in the north. And you can see all the way down to the Negev in the south. And he said, go ahead, Abraham, look around, north, south, east, west, what do you think? Oh, it's all right for a, a camping spot, but <laughs> I got bigger plans than this, said Abraham. I look for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Abraham wasn't satisfied with that little piece of land. God had enlarged his heart to anticipate heaven itself. And so Abraham, he, yeah, he, he said, uh, this is all right just to pitch my tent here, but I'm not going to settle down here. He was loaded. He was a rich man. He had probably a thousand servants, but he lived in a tent all his life because he said, I, I don't want to get connected here. This isn't home for me. God has prepared for them a city. Is that, is that referring to um, the church? No, it's referring to the Old Testament saints in Hebrews chapter 11. And it embraces all of us here. We see, I think, kind of a little illustration of this in the story of Ruth, don't we? Ruth is a Gentile. The blessing should have flowed from Naomi to Ruth. But instead, it flows through Ruth back to Naomi. And she ends up at the end of the story holding a little baby in her arms. They call it her baby, but it's actually come through Ruth. So the blessing should have come through Israel to the Gentiles, but Israel largely failed in doing that. They rejected, officially rejected their Messiah, and, they, and as Isaiah says, all day long I stretched out my hand to an arguing people. But I've been found of those who sought me not, sinners of the Gentiles. And so the olive tree's been cut down, and the wild olive has been grafted in. And here we are, sinners of the Gentiles, enjoying the Psalms. Well, they weren't written for us, you know. Enjoying Israel's Messiah. Well, he came to the lost house of Israel. How did we get in on it? I was found of those that sought me not. So here we are, sinners of the Gentiles, saved, grafted into the tree. We feel the sap, the life of the Hebrew scriptures and the love of the Hebrew Messiah. And he's ours, and we enjoy these things. But you know, there's a future for Israel too, and God is going to graft in again Israel. 
Today, the world, if they want to know what God is doing, they check in with uh, Billy Graham or the Pope or, you know, they'd never think of going to the Jews. The Jews have abrogated their right to be the representatives of God in the world. But you know, there's a day coming when once again, the Jew will be seen as the representative of God in the world. They'll take hold of a Jew and say, we want to know your God, take us up and <laughs> let us know. They will speak for God. Once the church is taken out of the way, then they again will become God's representatives in the world. So it's not altogether clear uh, sometimes when we read through the scriptures, but it seems to me that in the Old Testament, we had a work of God, a work of grace. People were saved by grace, people like Abraham and many others, Gentiles got saved. But what happens at Pentecost is a new thing. And I have a sheet in the back of your book that showed the distinctive characteristics of the church age. A real man on the throne of God interceding for us, never happened before. The Holy Spirit has come to indwell every believer and be with us forever, never happened before. The full revelation of God in the incarnation, the complete canon of scripture, the blessed hope of the imminent return of Christ, um, the universal gospel to be preached to every creature. I don't have to walk up to someone and say, excuse me, where do you come from? To find out whether I can give them the gospel or not. So, that, so these characteristics of this age are obviously distinctive. And we are linked to Abraham. And we will, I believe, share eternity with Abraham. On the other hand, there is a nation that's born in a day, an earthly people who will get an earthly inheritance. I don't believe that marks out these people of faith who will be linked with us. Will they be part of the church? I don't think so. I think the church is a distinctive work of God that is laid on the foundation beginning with the apostles. But I do believe that these Old Testament saints will enjoy the riches and the fullness of uh, the presence of the Lord. They, they longed for that, and I think they'll be included. Now, that may be clear as mud. If so, please forgive me. But uh, I've tried to pull together several ideas, and there's a lot more to be said on the subject, but maybe that will give us a few things to think about. Here's a question. Um, Is the job of spreading the gospel committed to the church, or is the Great Commission given to individuals? Well, we know that the Great Commission was given before the church was born. Assuming the church was born at Pentecost, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church, and it was something that he was, he was laying the foundation for at the cross. He's the chief cornerstone, and the middle wall of partition could not be taken down until Jesus came and fulfilled the scriptures, until he died. And through the cross, he made of two, one. So when Jesus was going to go back to heaven, um, before Pentecost, before the descent of the Holy Spirit, he commissioned his own to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So in its primary sense, it was given to individuals. And when we look, we'll get into this a little later, when we look at the gifts given to the church, we search in vain in, Ro in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14 and 1 Peter 2 to find the gift of evangelist. Kind of interesting, isn't it? The fact is that we're all witnesses. Every child of God is a witness. You shall be witnesses to me. And the scripture says that the early believers, as they were scattered through persecution and so on, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. The word is gossiped. In other words, it wasn't so much, let's have a meeting, bring the people in, stand up, preach to them. It was everywhere they went. They were talking to people in the markets and, uh, and uh, in the street corners and everywhere they went, they just shared the gospel. That's what it ought to be like, don't you think? I think that's the idea. Not, it doesn't, the Lord didn't say go into all the churches and preach the gospel. He said go into the world and do it. Don't invite them in here. You go out where they are and reach them where they are. That was the original intent, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And uh, so the individual believers were called on to do this. When you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the famous verse that talks about the early activities of the church, 
as far as them coming together, there's no gospel meeting listed, is there? What happened was they came together for mutual encouragement and prayer and worship and uh, teaching, and then they went out into the world with the gospel. That was the original design. And I think we, you know, traditionally we've had this nice situation where people were used to going to church, and so we'd come and they'd all get dressed up and sit and look at the front and listen to the preacher, and they like to sing hymns and all, but that's not anymore. The majority of people are very un... That, that, that makes them very uncomfortable. In fact, when we were in Newry a few years back, we picked the two best-known hymns, Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art, to begin our gospel effort. And as soon as we began, some people got up to leave. Somebody ran after and said, what, what's the problem? Well, this is obviously a Protestant church service. We didn't know that's, that was the arrangement. <laughs> because that's, we've designed gospel efforts the way we like them, not the way sinners find them appealing. Jesus had his gospel meetings on the side of the Sea of Galilee. Paul preached at Mars Hill. I don't think they gave out a hymn. You know, they, they presented the message in the daily experience of life. Does the church have a responsibility as far as the gospel is concerned? Absolutely. And what is that responsibility? Well, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 4, now you find the evangelist. And to your utter amazement, you discover that the role of the evangelist is akin to the role of the teacher and the shepherd in equipping the saints so they can do the work. Right? Ah, so here's a man who is an evangelist. Yes, of course, he preaches the gospel. But one of his primary objectives is to equip the saints so they can do it. Now that, we need more of that. We need people who know what the gospel is, who know how to communicate the gospel, who are actively engaged in multiplying themselves by helping other people. Not, not, you don't just invite a preacher in and he does it. His role is to equip the saints so they can do it when they go into their daily lives, wherever they are. And once people get the word that the Christians in this local church here, they really care about people. And they know the Bible, and they can explain it to you so you can understand it. They'll start knocking on our doors. Did you know that? They will. I was just talking to a man, Craig Legro, lives in Rockford, Illinois. He's an aeronautical engineer. And uh, his company got a massive contract from the U.S. government. And then a little contract tacked onto it, a mere $11 million, you know, chicken feed. And so his boss said, we're not interested in the little one. He said, you're not? No. Well, how be if I write up a proposal and go to our sister company and see if they'll take it? All right. So he went over to the sister company and sat down with four engineers and made his presentation. And they looked at each other and they looked at him and they said, well, we'll, we'll accept the contract on one condition. He said, what's that? They said, we understand you're a Christian. Yeah. Well, we want you to start a Bible study here. And if you'll teach us the Bible, we'll, we'll take the contract. Fifteen engineers showed up for the first Bible study. See, the devil's lie is nobody's interested. It's not true. The problem is we're not connecting. Uh, the poet has said, the music of the church bell is soft and sweet, but it isn't in tune with the music of the street. Like, it used to be that the that the way church was done was the way everybody, I mean, all the ladies went out and wore hats and they all put on gloves and, and people were respectful and they sat there and they liked to get dressed up. And, but that's not the way it is anymore. It's not a matter of downgrading the church to get the, the sinners in. It's a matter of the church being equipped to go out to where people are in their context and sharing the gospel. So, yes, the church has an obligation. An obligation, first of all, to teach people what the gospel is. What does it mean? What is salvation? And, and to communicate it so that people understand the doctrine of the gospel. And then secondly, the, the need to pray for gospel effort. There are people in local churches and they're out there slugging it out in, in a prison work or whatever, and their own church hardly prays for them. We need to be upholding them in prayer. We need to be praying for and supporting pioneer evangelists who are going out, as Paul would say, into the regions beyond where Christ's name isn't heard and plowing up new ground. 
They're the forgotten men of the church. If, the, if you go to Pongo Pongo, we'll support you, but if you're going to go down the road to the south of Ireland, well, where's that? Well, we need to, we need to think about that. So, yes, the church has an obligation to train people, to equip them with the gospel, to support the work of the gospel, to pray for gospel work, but yes, primarily the obligation is on us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to take it with us and wherever we go to share the Lord Jesus. Anyway, time's up, isn't it? And I think... There may, I think that's all the questions I got. There may have been one more. Oh, sure enough, sorry. We have two minutes, do we? Sometimes when people get baptized, they don't come in to the local church at that time. Young people say they aren't ready to make a commitment yet. Isn't there a danger, however, that they'll never actually commit themselves to the responsibilities and therefore also to the privileges of full fellowship in the local church? Okay, let me be straight with you here. Every generation has its fatal flaws. Older Christians, their greatest difficulty is being transparent. And that's why it's very difficult for them to disciple young Christians, because you've got to open yourself up and let people see what you're really like. And so for an older Christian to say, you know, I really struggle with this, it's like, oh, I'm going to lose my dignity. You know, they're not going to respect me. Uh, the older generation, they were very private. My mother was never pregnant. She had three kids, but she was never pregnant. <laughs> That's true. They never talked about it, never used the word. I remember one day a preacher spoke about a phrase pregnant with meaning, and everybody blushed. Like, you just didn't talk about that sort of thing. It never happened. You, as soon as you began to show, the lady stayed in. Well, I mean, things have obviously changed. And today, everything's out on the table, and young people are quite free to speak about all sorts of things. But it's very difficult for older Christians to be transparent. That's a tough thing for them. And young people have to understand that. Younger people have their problem. It's the problem of making long-term commitment. They've grown up in a society like even my generation. I knew of one divorced woman in our whole community. People, they were together for life. That was the way it was. And you worked, you got a job at the factory, you were there for life. Everything was, you know, long-term commitment. But today, they say, well, you have five careers by the time you're done. And usually five wives or husbands, too, you know. That's the kind of society we live in. And young people look at that and they say, I'm not prepared to step into something where it's going to fall apart. I don't want, I don't want to do that. And so it's, it's a generational problem that young people find very difficult. If you're going to be used by God, you've got to get over it. See, they're real fine young people. They're quite happy to do something for a weekend, but don't ask me to, like, as soon as I say to be a Sunday school teacher for the rest of your life, they get claustrophobic. They start to gag. They run for the door, you know. It's, I can't take that kind of thinking that, that I do this for the rest of my life. I say, well, where do you live? Well, I'm presently in this town. I, they don't know if they'll be there two years from now, but I'm present. That's where I'm... Pre <laughs> they're, they're even afraid to tell me where they live. It's just amazing to me. In fact, I've got an article to go in the next Uplook magazine from a young person writing about this very thing. She calls it commitment ophobia. <laughs> and so you can understand that they become disillusioned because so many things that are supposed to be sure and steady, they aren't. And everything is collapsing. Our civilization is unraveling. So the questioner has a good question. What is the pattern in Scripture? Saved, baptized, continued steadfastly. That's the pattern. But let me point out that when I look at Acts chapter 5, 14, I see that they didn't just say, okay, uh, saved, good, get baptized, good, okay, see you later. See, that's what we do. We throw them in the deep end. Only the strong survive. In Acts chapter 14, listen, here's what they did. They preached the gospel. They taught many. They confirmed the souls of the disciples. They exhorted them to continue in the faith. They warned them that through much tribulation we must enter into the kingdom. They ordained elders, they prayed with them, they commended them to the Lord. That's a pattern, isn't it? 
That's what we need. If you, if you expect, well, young people, baptized, okay, now we want you to carry on. Well, you know what the young people need that are new Christians and they've just been baptized? They need someone to come alongside them and spend time with them and show them how to study the Word and how to develop their gift and how to pray and how to worship. You know, if, if an older person, the problem is not with this young believer not being committed, the problem is that older Christians are not prepared to be committed to the young person, to give their life to raising up those young people. That's what we need. And, you know, when we read about the Lord Jesus, it says that he chose 12 men that they might be with him. That's the number one issue. If older people can convince a young believer, I really want to spend time with you. I want to spend some quality time. I want to be with you. Not, not bossing them, befriending them, encouraging them, helping them. That's what they need. And if older people would do that with new believers, I don't mean old people. There are some of you here, and you're, you're 40, you're, you're over the hill. 35 is middle age. Don't forget it. If we'd start doing that with the young people, instead of just saying, here's the assembly, jump in, be committed. If we would encourage them, confirm their souls, encourage them, help them, they'd get committed. They'd be committed, maybe first of all, to us. But our idea is, follow me as I follow Christ. We would hand them over, so to speak, to become disciples of the Lord Jesus. But that's really, to me, the issue there, if we can be encouraged. And there's a whole section in here on how to disciple young people. So you might want to take a look at that. Anyway, thank you so much for the time. I know it's late. You've got to drive home yet. We'll just finish off with the word of prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for Christians who want to learn the word, who want to know about the church, who want to think through the issues, and who want to embrace the truth. They want to help people. They want to build up one another in our most holy faith. Encourage them, we pray. And as we go from this place, help us to take with us the joy of it. It's a tremendous thing to belong to the Lord, to be part of the church, to have uh, unlimited vistas before us. We shall reign with him. We shall know him, love him, serve him forever and ever. And in the meantime, we have this tremendous challenge before us. Help us to have a passion for it, to say he really meant that we should be involved in this, and we want to be involved, not only in the salvation of souls, but in fulfilling all of the Great Commission to disciple people and to bring them into the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Watch over us as we head home. Keep us safe. Perhaps give us little opportunities this week to speak for the Lord Jesus. Bring people to us that are searching. And if you don't mind, Lord, let them bring up the subject and help us to speak a word for the Savior. Encourage us in this. Encourage us to help other Christians, to encourage other Christians, for older Christians to go to young people and say, we thank God for you. For young people to go to older Christians and say, we're, we're just so glad that you're, you've carried on faithfully all these years. Help us to be encouragers one of another. And we pray, Father, for those who might have been here tonight and might have benefited from it who didn't come. We pray that thou'lt move in their hearts and that together we might enjoy some weeks of heaven on earth as we think about heaven on earth. For this is what the church is, a heavenly people presently on earth, living out Christ, a little outpost of heaven, God's local reps, manifesting how wonderful he is day by day. We commend ourselves to thee, ask for safety, and for happy hearts as we travel home now in the Savior's name. Amen.